his ways, Satan had me totally deceived. Lucifer, Beelzebub, Belial, Prince of Darkness, the Wicked One, Old Nick, Mephistopheles, Satan. The devil goes by many names and has had many faces over the years. But who exactly is he? What does he look like? His very existence has been a source of debate within the Christian church since its beginning. His role within God's scheme has been argued back and forth throughout the ages. Here we will show you the devil in all his guises. Judge for yourself if this supreme evil still walks the earth, tempting, seducing, and corrupting those of little faith. All religions have devils and demons, forces of evil that seek to harm us. According to scientists and other secular scholars, these devils and demons are a means of labeling those unseen and often unjust forces of nature that cause us harm. An evil supernatural being must surely be behind it all. The word Satan means adversary, and the term appears in both the Old and New Testaments. So we see in the New Testament the devil as a chief of a horde of demons, uh, uh, a being who is able to possess and obsess human beings, a being who is able to tempt humans. And of course, the most dramatic moment in the uh, devil's uh, uh, part of the New Testament story is the temptation of Christ himself. Since then, Satan has been attacking both God and man. He walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So the devil here appears as a fallen angel a being of great power that God has created, which has chosen to do evil, has led many other angels astray, and they have become demons, and then is also doing his best to lead uh, human beings astray. But according to the Christian faith, the devil's powers are not limitless. According to the New Testament, the devil's final defeat will be when Jesus Christ returns in the second coming and casts Satan into a lake of fire. Throughout the ages, the devil has been represented by many and varied imagery, as a snake, as a man, a beast with horns and a tail, as a nightmare with bat's wings. The devil's image today in most people's minds and in cartoons and movies and so forth has, um, has almost become kind of humorous. So we all know that he's red, that he's got a uh, tail and horns, he carries a pitchfork, he's got uh, hairy legs and, and so forth. This is our stereotype of the devil. The devil really represents, is either a real creature or at least a metaphor, a powerful metaphor for a real creature which uh, epitomizes the power of evil in the world. And so we've got to take that uh, idea seriously. Other impressions of the devil are far less flattering, but it's still an image that has stayed with us throughout the ages and certainly won't be disappearing overnight. Witches and werewolves had been part of our folklore for many centuries before the Christian church took an interest in them. But all this changed during the 15th century when the Catholic church decided that a deal with the devil was a means by which witches gained their magical powers. This deal was called an infernal pact. The concept of selling one's soul to the devil is nothing new. The most famous tale or should I say infamous tale of an infernal pact, is that of the German doctor Johann Faust. Dr. Johann Faust lived around the late 15th century. He taught in the German universities, told fortunes, and did conjuring, and claimed to have sold his soul to the devil. His life has served as inspiration for numerous books, and in the first story published about him, Faust apparently sold his soul to the devil for 24 years of youth, magical powers, knowledge. And although the Christian church never produced any real proof that such infernal pacts had taken place, it issued edicts that declared war on all practitioners of the black arts. Any supernatural event that was not caused by God must belong to the devil 
and must be stamped out. To help expose those in league with the devil. In nomine Satanas, Lucifer excels his day. In the name of our most exalted God, Satan, Lucifer, I command thee to come forth. Handbooks detailing the practices of witches were published. The most famous of these was the Malleus Maleficarum of 1486. Translated, it means the witch's hammer. In Scotland, King James I presided over one of the most famous witch trials in Europe, the North Berwick Witch Trial. The five women standing trial were accused of using witchcraft to kill the king. After being tortured, they all confessed to the charge. Their leader was Ann Simpson, who confessed to performing satanic rituals in the church, with the devil appearing and demanding that all witches present do penance and kiss his buttocks as a sign of duty. This and other acts of sorcery were carried out, all in the attempt to kill the king, and all were unsuccessful. After this trial, King James went on to write his own guidebook about demons and witches, entitled Demonology. In it, he stated that assaults of Satan are most certainly practiced and the instruments thereof merit most severely to be punished. But it wasn't only the village wise women who were the targets of this witch craze. No woman was safe. And in fact, whole villages would have their entire adult female population decimated in a witch hunt. And being a man was no guarantee of safety either. Werewolves were also thought to be witches male witches who through their infernal packs with the devil turned into wolves at night to ravage the countryside raping and murdering young women and children in 1589 eyewitnesses claimed to have seen a transformation of a man into a werewolf for years germany had been plagued with murderous attacks against young women the Christian church's hunt for the devil and all those in league with him continued for over 200 years. We can now legally and legitimately worship the devil if we choose. And during the last 100 years, a few men have been bold enough to do just that. The first of these individuals was the infamous Aleister Crowley. At the turn of the last century, he claimed to have channeled instructions from an alien source outlining the path to magical power. Aleister Crowley died in 1947, yet his writings would influence another man who founded the world's first openly recognized Church of Satan. The Church of Satan was founded in 1966 by Anton Zandor LaVey. His concept was to create a religion that was a first embodiment of a religion that worships the flesh rather than the spirit. Previously, all of the major religions in Western and Eastern history were concerned with spiritualism, not carnality. So this would be a church to worship things of the flesh, not the spirit. During LaVey's life, he found that the conventional wisdoms of society and modern religion were glib and hypocritical. The Church of Satan is very different from other religions. It's not the kind of organization where people attend weekly rituals. It's one that's a cabal of independent individuals that basically follow their own paths. They find their own way to achieve the best results they can for having happiness in their lives. If they ritualize, they generally do it in their own homes. We don't believe in setting up church structures that people have to gather in. It's much more underground than that, kind of the Orwellian cell system approach, rather different from most contemporary religions. This religious group has created controversy since its inception and yet it has also attained visible recognition and acceptance within society, with the U.S. Army including a section on Satanism in its religious services handbook. In the Church of Satan, we see Satan as symbolic. It's an archetype, one that represents the independent individual. It's quite apart from a Christian framework. We don't accept the Christian idea of there being a god and a devil, a creator and creations. We believe that Satan is essentially an idea and a symbol for us. According to LaVey, Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who because of his divine spiritual and intellectual development has become the most vicious animal of all. All of human consciousness is metaphorical and symbolic. It's natural to our species. 
So essentially, we pick the right metaphors and symbols that we feel resonate with the truth about the way man and nature functions. So Satan to us is this dark force that permeates and motivates nature, uh, akin to a force of gravity. It's not an entity. It's, it's not something to worship or something to sacrifice to, since it's not a conscious, sentient being. It's simply a natural force. There are nine rules or satanic statements put forward by LaVey in his Bible. They include... Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. And essentially, we are not passive people, we Satanists. We believe that if someone attacks us, we're going to return that fire. And uh, essentially, uh, we would use whatever means are legally possible. And uh, some Satanists might feel that they might have to go beyond the law. Satan represents all of the so-called sins as they all lead to physical, mental, and emotional gratification. Here we're referring to the classic seven deadly sins, which are basically the ones that would lead one into lust and sloth and all the good things, vanity that motivates you, and just all the things that actually are the, the basic elements that motivate humans to do things. Can the devil possess us? Can he enter our bodies and control us? According to the Bible, he has this power, as do his demons. There are numerous references in the Bible of Jesus exercising demons from those possessed. But does this still happen today? In the early period of the Catholic Church, exorcisms were very common and were even done by those with the simplest of faith. But since the end of the fourth century, the Catholic Church has ordained or authorized certain select priests as exorcists. This is still done today, although the newly ordained exorcist no longer receives the ancient book of exorcism, but the pontifical or missal is placed in his hands. There are strict instructions regarding the handling of suspected cases of possession. Each case has to be examined closely to determine genuine possession from certain mental and physical diseases. In the words of the church, the priest who is to conduct the exorcism should be a holy man of a blameless life, intelligent, courageous, humble, and he should prepare for the work by special acts of devotion and mortification, particularly by prayer and a fasting. The rite should take place in a church or other sacred place, unless illness otherwise prevents this. And if it must be done at the subject's home, then witnesses who ideally would be family members must be present, especially if the subject is a woman. The exorcist focused at all times on the power and authority he is using. The blessed sacrament is not to be brought near the subject during the exorcism. Instead, the crucifix, holy water, and relics of the saints are to be used to assist the driving out of the demon. If the agent of the devil is not expelled the first time, the rite should be repeated, if need be, several times. Do specifically ordained priests carry out all exorcisms? Unfortunately, no. Dr. Rebecca Brown, who has written the books, He Came to Set the Captives Free and Prepare for War, makes extraordinary claims of having personal contact with demons, including Satan himself. There are gut-wrenching claims of sacrifice and orgies in Dr. Brown's book. I watched in utter horror as the young man tied to a cross had spikes driven into his hands. I will never forget the stench of the burned and tormented flesh, the screams of the victim, his writhing agony. <laughs> Satan appeared in human form. his head back and gave a howl as a spike was driven through the man's heart, pinning it to the cross, killing him. 
The crowd went crazy, screaming and laughing in crazed ecstasy at the victory. They loudly proclaimed all victory and power and honor to their father, Satan. Satan vanished shortly after that to go on to the next Black Sabbath sacrifice. At his departure, the meeting turned into a sex orgy, human with human and demon with human. The bizarre claims continued throughout the book. I also made a number of trips to other countries, including the Vatican in Rome, to meet with the Pope. All my trips were for the purpose of coordinating Satan's programs with Satanists in other lands. The Pope knew very well who I was. We worked closely both with the Catholics, especially the Jesuits, and the high-ranking Masons. In her book, He Came to Set the Captives Free, Dr. Brown recounts the story of Elaine, a female patient of hers who was a former high priestess in a powerful underground satanic cult known as the Brotherhood. Dr. Brown never disputes any of the claims Elaine makes. Instead, she goes on to describe the daily life-threatening battles she had casting demons out of her patient. The demons began to surface and speak through Elaine. I will never forget that first demon. I am Yagog, the demon of death. And you are all fools. Suddenly a shaman figure appeared. This shaman figure presenting himself in radiance as an angel of light was actually the prince of darkness, the prince of the power of the air ruler over a vast kingdom of evil, <laughs> Satan himself. Fish was born in Washington, D.C. in 1870. An orphan bedwetter, he would later tell reporters, I was unmercifully whipped, and daily I saw boys doing many things they should not have done. A New York resident, Fish presented the outside world with a meek Christian family man who adored his children. But things quickly changed when, in 1917, his wife deserted the family. It was this event, experts say, that triggered his manic descent into sadomasochistic behavior. He began to suffer from hallucinations and became obsessed with the religious concept of self-punishment. His children often witnessed him hitting his nude body with a nail-studded paddle until he bled. I always had a desire to inflict pain on others and to have others inflict pain on me. I always seemed to enjoy everything that hurt. Fish had spent a lifetime torturing victims, torturing himself, you know, just deriving all of this pleasure from pain. And cannibalism really, in a, in a sense, was uh, the only thing he hadn't tried. Fish was known to police as a minor nuisance but nobody had the slightest idea of the scale of his activities. The police report later recorded. On June 3, 1928, Fish, calling himself Frank Howard, arrived on the doorstep of Albert and Delia Budd's apartment in New York City. He was there in reply to young Paul Budd's advertisement in the newspaper. Paul, 18, was looking for a job, and this Mr. Howard had come to offer him one on his fictional Long Island farm. 
Delia persuaded the old man to stay for lunch. Even though Albert Budd wasn't very impressed with the way this Frank Howard looked, he did seem credible and he knew how eager his son wanted to work. They had just sat down to lunch when the Bud's 10-year-old daughter Grace returned home from church. This pretty young girl captivated Fish. It was then that this kindly, polite old man remembered that his sister was holding a birthday party for his niece that very day. He suggested that while he was waiting for Paul to pack, he could take Grace to the party. Albert wasn't sure that he should let her go, but Delia Bud thought it would be good for Grace. It was the last time that Mr. and Mrs. Bud saw their daughter, alive or dead. As the police suspected, everything Frank Howard had told the Buds was a lie. They immediately mailed out flyers to police stations throughout the country. There were a couple of solid clues, but as time passed, the trail went cold. Delia Bud, the missing child's mother, received a chilling letter. On June 3, 1928, I came to your house. We had lunch. Grace sat on my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her. Under the pretense of taking her to a party, I took her to Westchester, to an empty house up there. First, I stripped her naked. How she did kick, bite, and scratch. I choked her to death. I cut her in small pieces. It took me nine days to eat her no. entire body. She died a virgin. No. In writing the letter, he was clearly reliving the experience. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons the letter is so detailed. And then, of course, you know, there's just the very sick uh, gratification he probably derived from knowing how much agony this was going to cause this woman. Fortunately for Detective William F. King, the envelope had an imperfectly erased address. Caught, Fish confessed to killing Grace Budd. He described how he had been overcome by what he called his bloodthirst. Police were able to tie Fish to three other unsolved murders. In all, authorities believe Albert Fish killed at least 15 children. There's an analogy there between uh, uh, what somebody like Fish does and certain sorts of sexual libertines. Uh, the kinds of experiences that they need after a while just become increasingly bizarre and baroque and extreme. Once you've done one thing a hundred times, you really need something more intense. And cannibalism really, in a, in a sense, was uh, the only thing he hadn't tried. Police were amazed at the matter-of-fact way he described his cannibalism. It, it was like a housewife describing her favorite methods of cooking. Doctors were shocked by the level of his sadomasochism. X-rays revealed Fish had inserted up to 29 needles in his pelvic region. Despite this evidence, Albert Fish was deemed to be legally sane and found guilty of the murder of Grace Budd. On January 16, 1936, Albert Fish was executed. What possessed Albert Fish and others like him to consume the flesh of another human being? Fish would probably offer one explanation for his cannibalism, uh, which was that he had become obsessed with the notion of tasting human flesh after hearing stories about uh, people committing cannibalism during this terrible famine in China. Fish was a very, very, very exceptionally deranged human being who really ultimately indulged in every known perversion Andrei Romanovich Chikatilo's murderous rampage lasted 12 years, beginning in 1978. The man that history remembers as the Butcher of Rostov was born in 1936. 
At an impressionable age, his mother told Andre that seven years earlier, his older brother Stefan had been kidnapped and eaten by neighbors. The story had a profound effect on the chronically bedwetting, much teased boy. Uh, there, there's something happens uh, in the upbringing and the psychological development of serial killers um, that allows that very, very kind of ancient atavistic impulse to, to be acted on. He eventually became a teacher at a local school, but there were reports of sexual assaults against students. He was made redundant in 1981. Experts have profiled as modus operandi. He soon found a job as a supply clerk at the local industrial complex. The job entailed a lot of travel, which took him to many railway and bus stations. It was there that they found his victims. Chikatilo preyed on the weak and vulnerable, particularly young vagrants. The advantage of preying on vagrants in Russia was that nobody reported them missing because officially they did not exist. They only became known when their bodies were found. Chikatilo was savage. When police recovered the bodies of his victims, many were missing body parts. Many females missing their uterus and nipples, and the males had genitals and occasionally tongues sliced or bitten off. By September 1983, the Central Moscow Militia, concerned by the number of dead children that were being reported by the local police, took over the investigation. One of the things, first of all, obviously, that's so fascinating to us about serial killers is uh, that they often look so harmless and normal. Um, you know, that whole Jekyll and Hyde phenomenon is very, very fascinating to us. Finally, in November 1990, Chikatilo was arrested after trying to pick up another victim. Police found it difficult that this gentle, softly spoken man was responsible for all these brutal crimes. I think with each new crime they become increasingly, oh, that they get away with, uh, they become increasingly emboldened um, to try uh, crimes of, 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 uh, of greater intensity and so on and so forth. Andre Chikatilo described in chilling detail how he had tracked, brutalized, raped, and murdered his victims, sometimes removing body parts and eating them and drinking their blood. They descend more and more and more deeply into this pit of, of horror. His trial began in 1992. Chikatilo was locked inside a specially designed cage surrounded by armed guards. This was not so much to contain the prisoner, but rather to prevent the relatives and friends of the victims from attacking him. Chikatilo was found guilty and sentenced to 52 individual death sentences. The man referred to as Russia's Hannibal Lecter was quickly executed by a single shot to the back of the head. Fred and Rosemary West met in the summer of 1968. Rose, a rebellious 15-year-old of incredible easy virtue. Fred, a convicted thief and child molester and father of a four-year-old girl who had deserted his wife, murdered and dismembered a mistress and her unborn baby just in the previous few years. It's a match made, not in heaven, then certainly in hell. While Fred's in prison for stealing, Rose kills Fred's stepdaughter. And when the child's mother comes asking difficult questions, Fred kills her too. The Fred and Rose love pact would be signed, irrevocably drenched in blood. And a sickening foray into sex, slavery, and murder had begun. In the year 1972, the world was learning about Vietnam 
Henry Kissinger, and Richard Nixon, Watergate, and life after the Beatles. Fred and Rose go looking for a new place to live and find the answer to their dreams, 25 Cromwell Street. Fred likes it for its roomy cellar. Rose is caring for their two daughters, Heather and May. The couple hires Carolyn Owens as their nanny, but her job description quickly grows. She's made a prisoner of the West's sick sex and torture fantasies. She escapes and eventually goes to the police. While they're waiting for the trial, another girl moves in, but she will never leave. Linda Goff will become the first permanent resident of Cromwell Street. Despite Carolyn Owen's testimony, the magistrate simply cannot believe anyone is capable of such depravity and he leaves the West with a fine. The West's son, Stephen, is born, and they celebrate by going straight out and abducting 15-year-old Carol Ann Cooper. Fred enlarges the cellar. It's getting crowded, and he tells the neighbor he plans to improve it with sound insulation. Author Joe Syracuse has researched serial killers and the nature of evil, and nothing compares with Fred and Rosemary West. Most serial killers are in it for the sex, either with the victim when the victim's alive or with the victim's body parts when the victim is dead. Fred and Mary West were, of course, a very unusual, uh, was a very unusual case, primarily because uh, you had not only their own children involved, but you had other people involved as well. Between April of 1974 and April of 1975, the Wests abducted and killed three more women. Evidence later tendered at their trial described how they were intricately bound and kept alive for days. One left hanging alive from the beams of the Cromwell Street cellar became the couple's personal plaything. All the while, Fred West was working in a slaughterhouse, perfecting what was to become his signature technique, removing the fingers, toes, and kneecaps of his victims. Well, there are several reasons why a killer might dismember one of his victims. One may be for convenience, convenience of storing or convenience of moving. If you don't have, uh, and I, I hate to be so gross here, but if you don't have limbs to be concerned with, it's, uh, it, it makes a much smaller package. This is what the killers have said. It makes a much smaller package. It's easier to transport. Rose was busy too. While Fred drove ice cream trucks and worked in the slaughterhouse, Rose turned prostitute, working from home, despite having six kids. In fact, Rose's career stopped only when she was pregnant, her two dark-skinned children fathered by clients. It was a job Fred wholeheartedly supported, taking over the role of advertising and marketing, and spying through holes in walls and ceilings. They were sexual sadists. It seems as though that Fred was dominated by Mary. I can't speak with authority on that, but that's what it appeared to be from my understanding of the case. Uh, and they had, of course, had a target child that they would abuse. There were other children that they did not sexually abuse. Their three-story home became a beacon for the district's wayward girls, girls who would never, ever leave. Fred and Mary uh, West were, in fact, and an interesting couple because it seemed as though both of them were interested in sexually sadistic activities. Fred West was one of seven children, the apple of his mother's eye, a boy who looked up to his father as a, as a hero. Not bright at school, Fred was bullied by teachers who would bear the wrath of Fred's mother in retaliation. This earned Fred the nickname of Mummy's Boy. Basically illiterate, he would work mostly in the local slaughterhouse while operating his own at home. And he was completely, utterly consumed by sex. Almost invariably, you'll find that sex has become mixed up with the power needs of the offender or with anger needs of the offender. And yes, I do feel sorry for the serial offender as a child. I feel sorry for what he experienced as a child but I hold them responsible for what they've done as an adult. While Fred and his wife carried out their murderous rampage, Fred still dabbled in the petty crimes of his youth. He stole, which frequently attracted the attentions of the police, who never suspected they were walking over graves 
in a boarding house of the damned. But in 1986, at the age of 16, their eldest daughter, Heather, had taken all she could stand. Then she disappeared. Sometimes what they've experienced as children is abhorrent. It's frightening. And I thank goodness that, uh, that my children or I have never experienced anything like that. Police would learn later West had butchered his own daughter and got his son to help dig the hole in the garden where his sister would be buried. But it would take another six years before police had enough evidence to start digging in the West garden. The end was coming for the Wests. Another daughter confides in another friend. And this time, the police arrive. A dogged woman investigator talks to the children, and her fears for Heather, not to mention Fred's first wife, Rena, begin to grow. Rumors abound of what the Wests have buried under their patio. Fred has told neighbors he's built a torture chamber. A pathological liar, he seldom believed, except years later, when he claims to have killed 30 more women in and around Cromwell Street. As the bones begin to appear, Fred admitted killing his daughter in an accidental fit of rage. As the test showed the bones didn't belong to his daughter, he changed his story again. Eventually, the partner he'd known since he was as old as his missing daughter forced him to confess. Rose denied any knowledge of the killings. Fred took the rap, but she was forgetting the wayward young girl they hunted, Miss A, the girl who'd escaped. Her testimony was used at the West's trial, helping to commit Fred of a dozen counts of murder and Rose on ten counts. Among the victims, their daughter Heather, who simply had no chance. At the trial, Fred constantly tried to reach out to his wife. She spurned him. Her defense was that she had been Fred West's prisoner like everyone else. The court didn't buy it. Fred committed suicide on New Year's Day, 1995. Rosemary is appealing her sentence of life in jail. While the people of Hyde went about their daily business, a respected family doctor quietly murdered at least 15 of his patients. It's feared Dr. Death, as he's now called, could have killed more than 200, the real figure will forever be a mystery. Rumble weekday in Greater Manchester. This is Donald Tomkinson with you for the next four hours. And this is a little bit of a ditty called Bodrum Mushrooms by Stuart McLeod. Dr. Harold Shipman was like a thousand small town doctors. Snowy white beard and seemingly gentle demeanor. So dedicated to his practice of mostly grandmotherly old ladies, he liked to make surprise house calls. Dr. Shipman, I wasn't expecting you today. Come in, come in. Sometimes he came for a flu shot. And if 81-year-old Marie West suspected for a moment that she was to become his first known victim that March of 1995, the thought died with her in a fog of morphine. It almost involved entirely around our church. I was there in the house when he came back. He always came back 
to the house. Harold Frederick Shipman was born in Nottingham in 1946. A bright student who went to the best schools and excelled at rugby. Psychiatrists say the evil in Fred Shipman was triggered when young Shipman watched his mother succumb to the ravages of cancer. Fascinated, he saw her last days as doctors administered morphine to take away her pain. It was to begin young Shipman's lifelong obsession with medicine and with death. He lost his own mother when she was very young and he was young and maybe this is a re That's not a reason for murdering um, a vast number of, of people. I certainly know from my own knowledge of people here in the parish, I have no hesitation in saying that it's at least, at least 190 and many more. Shipman studied medicine at Leeds University and married young when his girlfriend got pregnant. Life was happy for a time until doctors at his first medical practice noticed strange disappearances from their medical cabinet. Shipman admitted he was a drug addict. By 1995, Shipman no longer had an addiction to drugs. He was hooked on something far more seductive, the power of life and death. He didn't need an excuse. He was sometimes just called on spec, say, for example, I was passing by and I just thought I'd um, drop in and see how, how you are. And um, we're taking special care of the older people. These um, fairly trusting ladies would just roll up their sleeve and say, that's fine. Over the next three years, the killings became increasingly more frequent. There were seven in just one month. For a monster, Shipman had the perfect cover a trusted family doctor on his rounds, sometimes killing patients even as friends and family looked on unaware. Investigating police would later marvel at his chilling calm, his icy confidence. Mrs. Meadow was still in the chair where she died. He never looked at her, but he immediately con confronted, um, and, that's, and that's the word I would use, con confronted the three girls no sign of um, sympathy or compassion. And his opening words, and, and they still ring in my ears, you know your mother had a heart condition, don't you? And she wouldn't accept treatment and she wouldn't go to the hospital. So she's only got herself to blame. But the foul stench of death was starting to settle around Shipman. The people of Hyde were starting to notice a disturbing pattern. If he got busy, he'd send people in for natural remedies sometimes. It was a very big surprise to find out he'd been doing what, what he was doing. Uh, on this side of the street, we were curing him, and on the other side of the street, he was killing him. Doctors in a neighboring surgery were among the first to pay attention. Dr. Linda Reynolds knew Shipman well. Under British law, it takes the signatures of two doctors on a death certificate before a body can be cremated. And when Dr. Reynolds realized Shipman was cremating patients at the rate of one every 10 days, the feeling of unease grew to horror. Slowly, the doctors started gathering evidence, but others had noticed too. Father Dennis Mayer of St. Paul's Catholic Church in Hyde says, the disappearance of so many of his parishioners sent a chill down the back of his neck. So I began phoning the police, um, giving them the names of parishioners who had died and said, uh, maybe you ought to inquire into how she died. Undertaker Deborah Massey had also noticed the extraordinary amount of work being supplied to her by Dr. Shipman. I noticed that they were all elderly women who lived alone, and all of them had died either in bed or sitting up in a chair. Father Dennis Mayer took his concerns and confronted Shipman. He just ignored me, carried on in the same vein, and said, by the way, there will be no um, problem about issuing a death certificate. Just call down to my office in, in the morning at half nine. I know why she died. Of course, now we know he did. 
Eventually, Father Mayer and the undertakers took their suspicions to police. They later dropped the investigation for lack of evidence. In the time it took for detectives to reopen the case, another three women, including the town's former mayor, would die. At Christmas, one of the undertakers told Dr. Shipman he would have to be good for the holidays. Shipman laughed and told her that wasn't possible. There were bodies pending, something she took to mean some of his elderly patients were unwell. Sure enough, that night, the undertakers were called out again to another of Dr. Shipman's patients. During all this time, Shipman lived a normal life, attending community meetings, getting his photograph taken for the local newspaper for helping raise money for charity. Only one aspect of his life seemed different. His home was strewn with rubbish, much of it the records of his dead patients. The Shipmans lived like pigs. Having been confronted by the undertakers, Shipman stepped up his schedule. Later, police would discover that he filled out death certificates before leaving for his house calls, inventing long-term illnesses on his patients' records that would explain their sudden death. But choosing Kathleen Grundy to kill was Shipman's big mistake. He had decided that a healthy and active 81-year-old needed a blood test, a sample that later the doctor simply couldn't find. Hours earlier, he'd written her death warrant. He decided Kathleen Grundy, Hyde's well-known former mayor, was secretly a drug addict, and she died from a fatal overdose sitting in one of her favorite chairs. We have obtained the actual police interview audio of Dr. Harold Chipman. I suggest to you that you have injected Mrs. Grundy with a fatal overdose of morphine that caused her to death. No. Would you agree that there's no medical history which would support Mrs. Grundy's very sudden death? Can we do die suddenly at her age? They just wear out. Even that might have worked, but for the first time, Shipman got greedy. He forged Kathleen Grundy's will on his office typewriter, leaving her entire 400,000 pound fortune to him. Suspicious, Grundy's daughter, Angela Woodruff, went looking for the two people who signed this mysterious secret will. They told her they signed a piece of paper for the doctor, Harold Shipman. Angela Woodruff went to the police. The investigation abandoned through lack of evidence was reopened. So were a lot of graves. The evidence against Shipman came quickly. In all, 15 bodies buried over a period of three years were recovered. All were Dr. Shipman's patients. All show lethal traces of morphine. The levels were such that this woman actually died from the toxicity of morphine, not as you wrongly diagnosed. In plain speaking, you murdered her. No. The time now by my watch is 17, 12 hours. I will switch off the tape. I have had a people dying over 18 years ago, and the families are now certain that she was one of, one of his victims. So what he did was very evil, and there's no excuse for it, it's intrinsically evil. He wasn't psychologically flawed, he was a very clever man. He was very, now we know, very callous, and a very, a very deceitful person. Harold Shipman was tried and convicted of 15 killings. He'll spend the rest of his life in jail. Dr. Schiffman cannot be forgiven for what he did because he has never in any way shown any sign of remorse. And up to this moment in time, this very moment in time, he's sitting in prison saying, I never did anything wrong.
January 1977. Two lovers leave a Queen's wine bar. They make it only as far as their car. Veteran 43-year-old Detective Joe Coffey takes special notice of the wounds that claim Christine Freund's life. Shot in the head with a large caliber weapon, it reminds him of the injuries and identical attacks on Joanne Leonine. Donna LeMay. And Donna Laurie. At one time or another, written up as mob hits gone wrong. David Berkowitz was a postman, as you know, and uh, he began shooting couples as they sat in parked cars uh, in New York City. And it was not something that he uh, impulsively acted on. It was something that he thought about. He did not uh, pre-select his victims, if you will. He would go out in search of victims, and he would seize upon victims of opportunity. Barely two months later, he struck again. The interesting question is, uh, was he mad or bad? And uh, that, that was first po posed by uh, Dr. Park Elliott Dietz, a forensic psychiatrist and friend of ours. And the answer is, he's bad. I mean, he was not a mad person. He was not insane, to use layman's terms. He was, in fact, a bad individual. By now, fear was beginning to infect the entire population. The 44 caliber killer a crack team of investigators was formed, but Operation Omega didn't have much to go on. That was until April 17th, 1977, not far from where the killer's first victim had been gunned down outside her home the previous July. 18-year-old aspiring actress Valentina Siriani was with her 20-year-old boyfriend Alexander Asal. It was three in the morning when another car simply drove alongside. They were both shot twice. Only this time, the 44 caliber killer left something other than the bodies of his victims. This time, he left a note and his name. Dear Captain Joseph Borelli, I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater. I am not, but I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I am the monster, Bezelbub, the chubby behemoth. I love to hunt, prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. Poorly written and riddled with spelling mistakes, the letter appalled the mayor of New York, who knew the media would love this story. Oh, they did. Sam became an instant celebrity. Profiling uh, as as we used it in the Behavioral Science Unit is not what most people associate with profiling. It's not going to solve crimes. It's intended instead to help the police narrow the focus of their investigation to a particular type of person, not a particular person. But the son of Sam was enjoying his notoriety. Newspapers had made him a celebrity, and he wanted to throw some fuel on the fire. Hello from the cracks and sidewalks of New York City and from the ants that dwell in these cracks and feed in the dried blood of the dead that has settled into the cracks. Don't think because you haven't heard for a while that I went to sleep. Sam's a thirsty lad. He won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. At the request of the police, parts of the letter were withheld. The secret passages offered alternative names that the killer invited police to check, telling them to get off their butts and knock on coffins. On the nights when he could not find a couple, he would uh, frequently go back to locations where he had previously killed, and he would unload his weapon, and he would dry fire uh, and recommit, quote, recommit, end quote, the crime. The only man who knew he was safe was David Berkowitz. He joined the army at 21, who ironically taught him to shoot. By the time he left three years later, he was an excellent marksman. Hi, how are you? But it proved well off target in his relationship with women. 
Later, he'd tell psychiatrists he'd had sex only once in his life in Korea. Oh, God, if the guys back home could see me now. Venereal disease was his only souvenir. He's a sexual murderer. He gets off on this. It's not just fun for him. Is, this is his sexual buzz, and he becomes more and more attracted to it as the killings go on. On Christmas Eve, Berkowitz took the biggest knife he could and attacked 15-year-old Michelle Foreman. Stabbed six times in the head, she ran bloody and screaming to an apartment block for help. Berkowitz calmly went for a burger and fries. Seven months later, he quit his job with a security company. The next day, pretty 18-year-old Donna Laurie was gunned down as she sat in her car outside her Bronx apartment. Historian and author Dr. Joe Syracuse takes up Berkowitz's story. Well, halfway through his killing campaign, he thought he heard, or he said, he heard uh, dogs barking, and the dogs started talking to him. The devil, or Satan, started talking through the dogs. And of course, the dogs are what did him in. He, he, uh, he started shooting a few dogs, and uh, pretty soon that would, that would catch up with him. You just can't go killing dogs in New York without people noticing. As the killings continue, Police have their monster on their list of suspects. They just don't know it. A family in New Rochelle received a get well card. Odd because no one's been sick. And it has a picture much like their German Shepherd. They contact the strangers whose names are signed on the bottom. They've sent no card. But they too have had disturbing mail. And their dog, a Labrador, has been shot. They suspect by a scary neighbor called Berkowitz. The connection hit like lightning. Berkowitz rented a room from the family in New Rochelle. Two of uh, my colleagues, John Douglas and Bob Rustler, did interview David Berkowitz. And it was at that point in time that he first acknowledged that uh, he really and truly did not hear and respond to voices from a dog, that he in fact made that up. But it was only after the last shooting that the last pieces finally fell together. A witness reports seeing a man hiding near the scene of the crime. What's more, she remembers parking cops in the area at the same time, and one of the cars that got a ticket belonged to David Berkowitz. Now, a trickle of coincidences turns to an avalanche. The policeman who called to check out Berkowitz's ticket is the daughter of the family who blamed him for shooting their dog. Not only that, Berkowitz is suspected of starting a fire outside a neighbor's front door. A neighbor who happens to be a sheriff's deputy. An army of police closes in on Berkowitz's apartment. They watch him walk out carrying a brown paper bag. They swoop. And Berkowitz smiles. Hi, my name is Sam. He smiles all the way to the courthouse where he's ordered to spend the next 365 years in prison. I am the monster, Basil Bub, the chubby behemoth. I love to hunt, prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. <laughs> 